the coroner's office said to the husband, if you bury her here, it's gonna cost you $250. But if you send her back home, it's gonna cost you $25,000. It's an easy choice, right? The man said, no, send her home. They said, what? Why send her home? It's gonna cost you a lot of money. The man said, the last person that was buried here rose from the dead in three days' time. <laughs> so Santa Claus. Today we're talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? And the topic that I'm going from is, what does the resurrection mean to you? What does the resurrection mean to you? You ever ask yourself this question in church? I don't know if you ever ask yourself this question. You know, the prevailing answer that you get sometimes is, it means... He loved me and died for me, right? And my sins were forgotten, forgotten. But, forgiven, I apologize, forgiven. But, was that the question? Was that the question that was asked? The question was not, what do you mean to him? The question was, what does the resurrection mean to you? But we can't understand the question, we can't answer the question if we don't understand why Yeshua had to die and the importance of his resurrection. So my desire today is to bring clarity and understanding in hopes that it will help everyone answer the question for themselves. Let us pray. Let the words of our mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, thy strength, thy redeemer. Amen. Amen. So, the scripture tells us that while on their way to Yeshua's tomb, the ladies wondered who would roll the stone away. Who would roll the stone away so they could anoint the body of Christ, right? Mark 16, 3, we had devotion, uh, not devotion, but Sabbath school this morning, and that was, <clears throat> excuse me, what we covered. But to their surprise, upon arrival, they realized that the stone was already moved. If you read it, Mark 16, 1 to 8, you would see that, right? As I said this morning, this stone was between one to two tons, which means that's about 2,000, that is 2,000 to 4,000 pounds, somewhere along the way there, right? Matthew 28, 2, 4 says, behold, right? But before I go there, a, a stone that heavy would take about 10 men or more to move, right? 10 men or more, probably more. I think, I think 2,000 pounds probably would take more. I, I, didn't, I didn't do the calculation, but what moved this stone? They went to go anoint the body of Christ, and these women that went, there's no way they were going to be able to move this stone. But Matthew 28, 2 to 4, reminds us that there was a great earthquake for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. So, do you know, and if you don't know, you're gonna to know today that Yeshua Jesus Christ is the commander and chief of the angels, just like this one. That was one. So imagine what an army of angels can do. 4,000 4, pounds was nothing for this angel. So I say this to you. There is no burden you can carry that the commander and chief can roll away like paperweight. Amen? The scripture said, 
The women were afraid. I don't know about you, but um, I'd definitely be afraid too. I'm not gonna lie. Imagine these women, they saw when the stone was rolled, they had to have seen that at some point, this, this, this stone, right? So, the, the, imagine they go and they see all these men rolling this stone to the table. And then now they get back and it's, gone, it's moved and only one person there. But that person was an angel. That figure was an angel. Right? Now, after the angel told them not to be afraid, I know you are looking for Jesus who was, sacri who was crucified. He isn't here. He was risen from the dead just as he said he would. He said, come see where his body was lying. Then he said, go quickly. Tell his disciples and Peter that he has risen from the dead. And he's going ahead to Galilee and you will see him there. In other words, he is risen. He is risen. Glory be to God, he is risen. Our Savior is alive and moving with authority. He is risen. This is the this is the cornerstone of our faith. He is risen. This is why the enemy try to prove that as a lie. But we know that he is risen. Amen? Amen. Amen. How did we get to here? Penal substitutionary atonement. What is that? Kingdom people. Kingdom people. King of people. Yeah. yeah, man. Talk to me, man. I, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm up here with myself, you know. Talk to me. King of people. Yeah. Somebody say amen. 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 Penal substitutionary atonement is where Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, Emmanuel, God with us, the one who brings peace and comfort, Jesus Christ, God in human form, put on flesh and walked amongst us. He came as a spotless lamb, ready to be slaughtered. Now, it wasn't because he deserved it, but because we did. We could not the punishment that came with our sin. Mm -hmm. That's true. Amen. But he could. Amen. He alone was worthy. He alone was worthy. See, he came up, he lived a sinless life as an example for us to follow. He who knew no sin became sin. He took on the full wrath of God. I wonder if we know what or who we're being saved from. Uh-oh, it's not saved. Definitely not saved. I tell you this, it got nothing to do with that guy. That guy is just a poser in the mix. Right? He's just trying to add you to his numbers. We are being saved from the wrath of God. That's what you're being saved from. A lot of us have this image of God, like as, as Sharif said, like Fabio. Who knows Fabio? That model with the long hair, right? Like Fabio, that's the image of God that we have. He's all about love. It's all about peace and love. Yes, he is. But he is about wrath. Amen? Amen? He came, lived a sinless life, and they hung him on a cross, killed him in a gruesome public way. Right? That was the most gruesome way to die in those times. And he suffered that, that day. But being a hundred percent God, and 100% man, death could not hold him down. Amen. 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 
strength could not hold him down. The grave could not hold him. Listen, he rose from the dead after three days, triumphant over death. With, with what? The gift of salvation. Turn to your neighbor and say, and say he died for you. Now, now I want you to encourage yourself and say, you died for me. Now I need you to speak to him and say, you died for us, so thank you. If you believe it, say it. If not, don't say it. Amen. Before I continue, let me, um, as the, the, the children message was going on, my dear sister, she, you know, she touched on something that I want to say publicly right now, right? About what the world wants us to believe this holiday is about. Holiday is about and what it means biblically, right? So let me just give you some information, bring some awareness, right? Easter as we know it, the name itself, it's, it came from a pagan goddess. And she was the goddess of fertility, right? She was the goddess of fertility. There's many pronunciations to her name. It's spelled E-O-S-T-R-E. -E. You can go look it up, right? People offer sacrifice to her. And believe it or not, there were some people offer um, sacrifice of children to this guys. Fertility, children, right? And over the years, they've adapted her name. And we are now using the adapted name and we're, we're what, what is it now? Easter. So that name came from a pagan goddess that those people used to sacrifice children to. Right? So people offer sacrifice to her around the full moon or around the March equinox, right? This is around the, the full moon and then at the day after is when we usually have Easter. That's why Easter is not always the same day every year, right? They also use the they also use the time to explore their fertility in a public way. If you understand what I'm saying, I, it's, I don't want to say it in graphic, and I can't say it right. Then then there's the eggs. So I, I heard the, the the young lady say, "Yeah, we the eggs and the rabbits and stuff." And I, I really want to say it publicly, right? The the decoration of eggs is a pagan tradition, right? Where doing so calls on the gods and goddesses of health and fertility, right? So when you, when you hide in the eggs and doing all this, that's what you're doing. That's what, it, that's what the original people, that's what they used it for, right? And the goddess is usually depicted with, with the hare, which is the, the wild rabbit, which is the, the bigger ones to the little cute furry ones, right? She's usually depicted with the hares, which are symbols of fertility as well. But gods, goddesses, eggs, hair, sacrifice, children sacrifice. It wasn't it wasn't palatable for, for families. It wasn't it wasn't okay for, for kids. So they kind of took that stuff and bring it to what we know right now. You have the Easter with the bunny delivering eggs and goodies. That's where we are right now. So as Christians, we shouldn't be celebrating Easter the way the world celebrates it, right? We shouldn't even, me personally, I, I, we don't use even the, the name. Amen? Amen. But let me try one. I just wanted to bring some awareness, right? So we have a problem, kingdom people. We have a problem. There's a very dangerous, deceptive theology being taught today, right? This theology teaches that there are many ways to heaven and that the God, that the good that you do will get you there. Hmm? The good that you do is enough and it will get you to heaven because God is love. Right? Right? Amen. Amen. So in other words, if you do more good than bad, you will get into heaven using one of the many ways. 
That's what they're teaching. That's what they're preaching. And this is a theology that is huge. And some of the most famous people are pushing this agenda. Right? But I'm here to tell you today that that is a massive problem. We have to do our utmost best to debunk that, right? This theology allows people to believe that it is acceptable to live a sinful, godless life and in debt because the Heavenly Father is love. He's going to allow you to enter because he is love. Wow. Right? Allowing, see, that is a life in the pit of hell. And if we propagate this, we will end up in hell with the devil. So this, this theology attempts to dwarf the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. So if this theology was true, right, then the death and resurrection of Jesus would be for nothing. It would mean that the, the foundation, the cornerstone of our faith was a hoax. And Christianity and our God, not authentic. Again, do you understand why they're trying so hard to debunk the death and resurrection of Christ? Let me get some clarity. John 3, verse 12. John 3, verse 12. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe? If I tell you of heavenly things. This is Jesus talking to Nicodemus, right? Nicodemus came in the night because he was ashamed. He didn't want to go in the day and speak publicly with Jesus, so he came in the night. And Jesus is talking to him right here. Verse 13. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What is he speaking about? Himself and his resurrection and his, his death, his, his, his uh, crucifixion. Amen? Amen? He was speaking about himself. And his crucifixion. There's two things there. Right? He, he mentioned this old this Old Testament uh, scripture, and he, he can find it in Numbers 21, 5 to 9, where he's talking about the children of Israel, they were rebellious against God and against Moses. Right? And God sent down a fiery serpent. And the fiery serpent was biting them and killing them in droves. Thousands of them were died. Right? And they came and they, they they cried to Moses, please talk to God for us. We, we are sorry. And Moses went and he spoke to God. And God said, God instructed Moses to make a brass serpent and hold it up and put it up. And everyone who is bitten by the fiery serpent, when they look up at this serpent, this brass serpent, they will not die. Man? Secondly, he said the Son of Man must be lifted up. Again, speaking of his crucifixion. Mark 8, 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and of scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. John 8, 28. Then said Jesus unto them, When he had lifted up the Son of Man, then shall he know that I am. Where did you hear that before? God was talking to Moses. I am. Tell them, I am. When they ask who sent you, I am sent you says, shall he know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself, but as my father had taught me, I speak these things. As my father has taught me, I speak these things. Christ is declaring that he must be crucified. Must. It's not optional. It's not a question where it's going to happen. He must be 
crucified. He came to earth for this purpose, to be crucified. That if he must be crucified, one can only ask, why must he be crucified? Verse 15 says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 16, for God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Wait, does it say that you can live a reckless, filthy, sinful life, and in death God will pardon you because you are good and he loves you? That's what I just read. You heard that, right? That's what it said? No. I don't think so. I know that's not what it says. But there are hidden meaning. There's a hidden meaning here behind repetition. When you see repetition in scripture, you gotta pay attention to it, right? When repetition happens, you wanna explore more, right? So it says that what that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have an eternal life. It is saying that naturally, naturally, everyone is in danger of eternal damnation, or in other words, we're destined to be punished with everlasting destruction in the lake of fire. Every single one. Every human being. Right? Yes. But all who feel they are sinners and have no righteousness on their own. And are willing to look to him as their only savior. As the serpent is lifted up. When you are bitten, you look to the serpent and you will not die. When you look to Christ Jesus, Yeshua, HaMashiach. When you look to him, you will not die. You have hope for eternity. Amen? Amen? Amen. Even though he paid the price with his life, salvation is full and salvation is free. And all who come believing with their whole heart shall receive eternal life. Now here's another question. Why should we believe in him? Why should we believe in him? Why should we believe in him? It says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. But why should we believe in him? There's a very dangerous deceptive theology, man. That this, this, this theology is terrible. And here's the problem. I, I kind of lost my way. <clears throat> Alright, so here we go. Why should we believe in him? Ephesians 2. Um, Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 10. And you had quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. And you had quickened who were alive and well and living in sin and okay, and when they die, they're going to heaven. We were dead! Yeah. Dead man tells no tales. We were dead. Again, why should we believe in him? Because we were dead and needed something something dramatic, something drastic, something radical to happen to give us life. Romans 6 verse 6, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. This, this dramatic event that occurred and it happened when Christ died and resurrected, taking the old you and giving you new life. Amen, somebody? Amen. But you see, we have a trifecta of trouble. That's what I coined it. A trifecta of trouble that has many in bondage. Right? Verse 2 says, wherein, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world. That's the first one. According to the prince of the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. The devil, that's the second one. Among whom also, we all had our conversation in time past in the lust 
of our flesh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh. That's the third one. And of the mind. And whereby nature. We are the children of wrath. Even as others are. Those are. Right? Gentiles are. We are children of wrath. So this is also a reminder to those who believe that you were once like the unbelievers in the world before you came to faith. Amen? Amen. But even though you believe that trifecta of trouble still affects you like every person, the world, the devil, and the flesh, hear this. This world is in constant rebellion against God. And little by little, it is brainwashing, it is conditioning its occupants to do the same. Amen. 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 Paul tells us not to conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We are in the world and constantly being subjected to all it has to offer. Everything wicked, evil, or perceived to be nice. Is that her beckons call? Amen? Amen. The world, physical attacks. Physical attacks come from the world. As if that wasn't enough, then you have the devil. See, when we're in the world, we're under the devil's government. Y'all didn't hear that. When we when we when, when we're in the world, not of the world, when we're when we're in this world, when we're of this world, when we're taking part in the things of this world, we're under the devil's government. The scripture tells us that Satan, who is the god of this world, has blinded the mind of those who don't believe. They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ. Who is the exact likeness of God. See we have. Demonic forces operating in the spiritual realm. And some manifest themselves through people. They are at work. They are at work. And they are working. They are working more than we work. Day and night. Night and day. 24-7. If you could add some more time to the clock. They will be working. They work. And why? They are plotting against us. Because they know their faith. And who's the overseer? The devil. He's like a lion seeking whom he may devour. Scripture tells us that for he rests not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Huh? Against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's what we are, we are warring against. Spiritual attacks. When we pray, we pray in the spirit. When we worship, we worship in the spirit. He is spirit and we must worship in his spirit and in truth. Why? Because our battle is not mortal. It's spiritual. Yeah. Then here's the worst part of it. The part that we always tend to push to the side. I'll tell you this. Sin is our natural desire. Like I'm here by myself again. But anyway, sin is our natural desire. We were born in sin. We were shaped in iniquity. Sin nature. That means we have inherited our sinful nature from our federal head, Adam, right? Yes. Or Eve. See, when he sinned, sin entered the world. And because of that sin, many more sin came from that sin. And we have perpetuated these sins throughout history. Yeah. And now it's it evolved into something that many of the disciples was alive, they, they, they wouldn't even understand what was going on. Like we sitting here living in this time and don't understand what's going on. Huh? Watch this. The world and the devil are so powerful in our lives because we love what they offer us. 
I'm just going to pause and let that sink in. Alpha Jesus. Y'all heard what I just said? I heard. I said it again, like, I said it a different way, right? Sometimes we blame the devil who has little or no doings. Mm -hmm. We sin because it is what we want and what we desire. We are drawn to sin because of our sinful flesh. Because of our natural inclination to sin. Amen. We make it easy when we come under a physical and spiritual attack from the world and the demonic forces that are at work. Yeah. Amen. So again, why should we believe in him? Because we are fighting a battle that we cannot win alone. Amen? Amen. We are constantly under attack from all fronts. All fronts. The world offers us everything that we love. The demonic forces, places, the deceptive devices in front of us. And because our flesh naturally wants to sin, we do it willingly. This is why we need Jesus. Amen. This is why we need Jesus. Amen. John 3, 19-21. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil they naturally love evil and they are blinded by the devil for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light neither cometh to the light lest his deeds should be reproved going to expose them. It's going to expose your, your dirty ways. It's going to expose your dirty deeds. Right? But he that doeth truth cometh to light. That his deeds may be made manifested that they are wrought in God. You must renew your mind and believe in him because he is the only one. Contrary to popular belief, he is the only one that could save you from yourself. And save you from the wrath of God. The remaining verses of Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2, verse 4 to 9, and uh, John 3, 17 to 18, speaks to the resurrection. Ephesians 2, 4 to 9. Verse 4 starts with, but God. But God. Are you, under, are you under attack by the worldly things? But God. <laughs> Is the devil and his demonic forces at your heels? But God. Are you having sinful, fleshy desires? But God. But God, who is rich in mercy. For his great love wherewith he loved us. Even when we were dead in sin. That quickened us together with Christ. By grace we are saved. By the grace of God we are saved. We were once dead in sin. And by his grace we are saved. Do we understand this, the severity of what is being said here? Yes. Verse 6, And hath raised, up, raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, Amen. that in the ages to come he might through the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. See the repetition again, verse 8. For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. The gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Nothing you did. Nothing you did. Huh? Get that to our souls. You, me, we could not handle 
the wrath of God. He was the only worthy one. Amen? Amen. You cannot win on your own. No matter what good you do, you are dead in sin. And as it is appointed for everyone to die once. If you die a physical death, when death comes, if you are stuck in, if you are, uh, uh, how do I say it? If you are stuck on stupid, you will be with your God, the devil in the lake of fire. No apologies. Let's bring this home. Verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So believe in him, because he came into this wicked world without condemnation. He died, he was resurrected, and he left us with the gift of salvation. And the choice is yours, the choice is mine. If you're here, the choice is yours. The choice is yours to live with him for eternity. He's not gonna kick your door in. He's not gonna, he's not gonna come and, and, and try to tear you down. Please follow me. No, the choice is yours. The songwriter said, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know, yes I know, he owns the future. Life is what? Worth the living. Worth the living. Just because he lived. He is the bread of life. He is the light of the world. He is the good shepherd. The true vine. The way, the truth, the life. Prince of peace, wonderful, king of kings, and lord of lords, alpha, omega, the beginning and the end. He is my rock, my savior, my comforter, my deliverer, my redeemer, my refuge, my counselor. Hallelujah. And he calls me friend. Amen. Does he call you friend? Hmm. What is he to you? What is he to you? Now with that, I pose the topic question again. What does the resurrection mean to you? Here's some of the list that I created. It means that through him, death is defeated. And we have the hope of salvation that goes beyond this life. It means that we have a host of angels on our side when we believe. It guarantees that those who believe in Christ will not remain dead but be resurrected to a new life of holiness. Hallelujah. It represents the ultimate act of love and sacrifice, emphasizing the eternal significance of Christ's teaching. It signifies that with Yeshua, the old man is passed away and the renewed man is resurrected with him. Listen, the resurrection is true and divine fulfillment of the prophecy. Listen, that should go through your inmost spirit, sending new life through your whole being. The resurrection means that God, God, God's love and mercy, they are deeper and wider than your greatest sins. God's love and mercy are deeper and wider than your greatest sin. It means if we believe, our destiny is no longer the lake of fire. The resurrection of Christ was and is a cause to die for. The resurrection of Christ was, still remains today, and will be after you die, a cause to die for. So come what may. So if you can hear my voice, 
Please know that Christ died for you. He is watching and waiting. You must choose to believe and follow him because salvation is yours if you want it. Don't fall for the many deceptions and the deceptive theologies that's out there. There's only one way to see God. The road is narrow, but broad is the road that leads to destruction. <laughs> See, no matter how good you are, no matter how good you are, the Word of God says you must look to Christ for salvation. Not yourself, not the pastor, not your mama, not your daddy. You have to look to Christ. I'll leave you with, I'll leave you with this word from um, Acts 3, verse 10. Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doeth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set anon of your builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen. 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 Thank you for the word, my brother. The Bible tells us in John chapter 13. That just before the feast of the Passover, 